sorry. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, kindly settle down. Uh, the speaker and the moderator has already arrived. Uh, we'll commence the program in a few moments. And uh, before that, as usual, uh, I thought I'll take this opportunity to brief you uh, what's happening in MMA and uh, what's not happening, uh, which sometime uh, uh, should happen. Uh, I thought I'll update you on that. Uh, let me uh, first tell you the events, what is uh, uh, going to happen, like 13th, today's event, which I'll brief you a little later. And on the 19th, uh, again, we have an MMA lecture on global economic scenario on India. And uh, the speaker, you must have already got the mail, Mr. Shivaraman, uh, re former revenue secretary, is a speaker. And I think it's a very, very pertinent uh, in today's uh, scenario because the global impact is really impacting the Indian businesses. And now we are going to move forward in some of the techniques. And he, I, I heard him talking on one of the economic forum, and I thought it will be very, very interesting for us. When I requested him, he rightly agreed and accepted to be there. So please block your calendar Tuesday, the 19th, uh, the same venue. Uh, Mr. Shivaraman, former revenue secretary, is going to speak to us. Again, on the 20th, we have, a, again, a brilliant success story. Uh, on the 20th, we have a Startup India, Stand Up India incentives. Uh, uh, no, 20th, I think there's a mix-up. 20th, we have a success story of it was done uh, by Samir Singla, CEO Uncle Sam's Kitchen. Uh, it's husband and Gunit Singla. Gunit is uh, Mrs. Samir. And they both started, and Sam's Kitchen, one of the finest uh, team here in Chennai. Husband wine combination and doing such a great job, I think it's really worth listening because both together doing a great job is really worth listening, actually. And uh, the two in kitchen, where the husband take care of the kitchen, wife take care of the business. I think it's a unique model. I think please be block your diary. It's not happening on the 20th evening at uh, thing. Then we also have a Startup India, Stand Up India, uh, the incentives uh, next session. And you all know, uh, we have already had a two session on Startup India and Stand Up India by, you know, Satya Kumar. It's a phenomenal uh, success story because more than 40 participants are there. All the four sessions you do that, I think it really give you a lot of insight. Uh, please do block your diary and attend that one. On the 22nd, again, the final session of the Startup India uh, and Startup India incentive is there. That's happening on 22nd. And on the 23rd, we have, um, it's an interesting event. It's not an MMA event. And the request came from the organization that is uh, the Institute of Public Auditors in India. Here, uh, this is Mr. Nassiman's memorial lecture. Nassiman is uh, the first uh, uh, Auditor General of India, and he's done a phenomenal work. And when the request came, I straight away agreed. Uh, this is open to only the people who are attending this event today. They're not open to, we are not sent a mail. But those who wanted to do that should, on your way back, I will tell Sundar to register, you must register name. This is Governance for Economic Development, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam. You know Dr. Arvind Subramaniam is the Chief Economic Advisor Government of India, brilliant speaker. And uh, so, you know, I, I will al always walk miles to listen to him. He's going to speak. This is happening on 23rd Saturday at 4 p.m. at SGS Shaba Bibula Road. This is a not MMA program. Repeat, it's not our program. Since I got the invitation to take about 30 to 40 people from MMA, I thought if I send a mail, I get about 200 people. I'm not, I can't manage. That's why I said today, your lottery. If you want to attend this event, please register yourself with Sundar to attend this event on the 23rd. Lecture by Dr. Arvind Subramaniam. He's the Chief Economic Administrator of the Government of India. Brilliant speaker. He's going to talk on the subject, Governance for Economic Development, and, uh, and be there on the 23rd evening at 4 o'clock at SGS Sabha. Then on the 23rd, again, we have an interviewing skill workshop. And again, 23rd, we have May 6th, we have an excellent uh, conclave, Challenges in Emerging Business Models. I've got this conclave, which is very, very interesting in a sense, uh, uh, there are so many things happening in startup, and uh, there are so many things uh, are the, the, the number of aggregators that have come up uh, in food and other businesses, the way they come up, they are also getting closed, actually. What is, what is it affecting these businesses? We also see, want to see what are the risks uh, they are taking and how this risk can be mitigated and what are the safety net they should have. So we are having a one-day conclave on challenges and emerging business models. This we are doing jointly with IAA. We have got a phenomenal sessions, uh, like starting up the right set of control. This uh, session will be inaugurated by Chandra. He's the vice chairman of Cagnus, and he's going to inaugurate the session. Then we have four uh, interesting business sessions. Uh, we have a special se session on Startup India, right sets of controls, and entrepreneur professional interface, where we have got two brilliant speaker. Chandu Nair is not confirmed. He'll be confirming. Venkata Kishan. And to chair this session, we have Vishi. Vishi Viswanathan, you all know, former MD of... Uh, uh, global firm in USA, now he was Thai and brilliant uh, entrepreneur. Then we have a session on 
operating controls in an aggregate, aggregated business model chaired by Loknathan. We have got two billion speaker. Rajesh Nahar, I know how many of you know him. He is a Chennai based CEO of cbazaar.com and also Srinjanam is the director of Beauty Hub. Because the aggregator model, we must know to understand how the business can sustain and survive. They are going to talk about what all the risk in aggregated model. Then cyber security controls, electronic finance section will be chaired by Vital Raj. Many of you know Vital Raj he is a director of uh, press time and he's also a member of the international ISACA member from USA. So it's a brilliant uh, guy to speak on the subject. We got two brilliant speakers, Muthu Kumaran, former secretary of the Cyber Society of India, and Asutosh Bhavgona is a scientist, is from Indian Computer Energy Response, uh, uh, is a New Delhi based organization. They they specialize in hacking, how to avoid hacking. It's, it's quite interesting to listen to this guy, he's a brilliant chap. Then we have the last session, digital economy, emerging opportunities, risks and challenges. Again, this is, uh, we are getting a brilliant speaker, Venkat Ramana is the president of Lifestyle, and uh, we are also getting a speaker from Flipkart and Amazon.com. So this is happening on the 6th, it's a paid program, uh, 1,000 rupees including service tax. Uh, it's really highly subsidized. I think MMS spends as much as 3,000 rupees for this event and uh, already we got quite a number of nominations for this event. You want to attend, please do come. It's happening on 6th of May. Uh, the mail will be being sent only today because we just finalized the speakers today. Then on the 9th, we got a very interesting program. Again, Raghupillai Memorial Lecture. This is a brilliant speaker again. I know how many of you knew Damodar Mal. Damodar Mal is the CEO of Reliance Retail Limited. And he's going to sp speak on something very, very interesting. That is, supermarket walla was a super up walla market. So it's very interesting because it's brick and market or what other one, because we want to make it interesting since uh, somebody may say we have to translate in Tamil. Maybe I think we should do that later. Supermarket walla was a super up walla. So which is one you have to decide. And uh, Damodar Mali will be going to be the speaker. This is happening on 9th of May, the same venue. Then we have on the 10th, again, uh, brilliant uh, thing, uh, thanks to Aviz. Uncommon leader, extraordinary lessons from the exceptional people. We have Narendran, principal consultant plane, is going to come and speak. And he's going to speak something very interesting. We already sent you the mail. His wife uh, was killed in that uh, Malaysian airline crash in 2014. Thereafter, how he managed the situation, how he is going to take care of children, how he managed his life. Because as a leader, this is the situation what is that's why we are going to bring in the series uh, which you are doing the joint with Aviz is the uncommon leader extraordinary lessons from exceptional people and uh, in june again we have another session by matthew jose is from ashoka fellow and founder of uh, paperman he's going to speak in june so every month we are going to have this series uh, uh, till we find common leaders so as long as we have uncommon leader this series will continue for <laughs> the common leaders are very difficult to get uncommon leaders are easy nowadays it looks like <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, this is what is the program uh, for you. To please mark your diary uh, updates and uh, be there for all the events. And uh, it will be a pleasure to have you with us. And do register your thing uh, so that uh, thing, uh, so that we, we make proper arrangements for your reception. And uh, before I finally close, if anybody wants to attend Aravind Subramaniam, please do register your name with Sunda. Sunda, please take down the name and so that only those registered today will be there. It's a lottery for them. Being coming attending an MMA program, you must get something extra benefit. Buy one, get one free today. <laughs> now, coming to today's evening, it's um, the uncommon leader, extraordinary lesson from exceptional people. It's indeed a privilege uh, for me to introduce uh, the first session, and we have one of the phenomenal speakers going to be there, Miss Neeraj Malik. We are, I'm doubly delighted because Neeraj Malik is not only, uh, our story will be known to you in a short while ago, exceptional speaker, exceptional achiever, more I'm delighted because she's a part of an army family, actually. So we are always uh, very, very close to the army family because uh, not necessarily the army family has got the way of life, actually, which she will share during her talk. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together to welcome today's distinguished speaker, Mr. Neeraj Malik, and the chairman and moderator, curator is Avis Uswanathan. May I request Avis and Neeraj to please come on to the stage, madam. Uh, before uh, I hand over the session to Avis, let me have the privilege of uh, introducing the moderator as well as the speaker for the day. Uh, Avis, you all know, he spoke to us a few weeks back, a phenomenal uh, thing. He's a life coach, inspirational speaker, happiness curator, author, organizational transformer consultant, who is lead change management, culture, and leads development mandates in corporate sector globally. Avis is also a well-known and acclaimed speaker uh, and uh, whose talks uh, invoke soul 
provoke thought and inspire you all listen to that and experience a few weeks back avi lives in chennai india and is married to vani vani is here the great support to avi's his soulmate and and the business partner they have two children ashirwad and anchal and a very warm welcome to avi's and i must also thank on behalf of each one avi's the one who put the seed in my mind put the thought in my mind that we must have that uncommon leader series and uh, because uh, uh, to do something uncommon in mma is very difficult because we do all common things he is a man who made us do one common thing and uh, this series will you know carry on for some more time let me have the privilege of introducing uh, ms neeraj malik and uh, she she'll be in conversation with uh, uh, avis uh, neeraj is an intense belief in the grace of god and the power of the love of the prayer has aided her to be overcoming the hurdles uh, and of her journey in life she has faced and conquered three of these challenges with the uh, joint drive neeraj childhood was spent uh, in the lap of uh, love uh, love and daughter with the cocoon of family's warm support and security her mother is unconditional love made her really a very bold and beautiful she is welcome each day with uh, adventure enjoying life and sheer gale and gratitude with uh, two surgeries uh, cancer 1998 and 2004 behind her neeraj calls herself as a conqueror and the important feature in her prescription for survival and laughter and fun things is to look forward to and after the first surgery she saw a record number of 56 movies in theaters during the th during her treatment in 1998 neeraj has been uh, counseling for cancer patients and she has been a source of inspiration for the people who are suffering from cancer she is available 24/7 and a pillar of strength to the people uh, who are traumatized by this disease i think big round a big round of applause <laughs> she is a graduate in social work and holds a bsc degree with a vast experience in both the fields and she is a trustee in an ngo of sankalp started by her uh, late aunt uh, kannan verma which is dedicated to the education of the girl child she has authored the book i inspire unique uh, treasure uh, aunt which is the uh, which uh, story of her like a discovery of 10 gifts and help her to face the adversities in life The book is available today for you to buy it for your thing, and uh, she has kindly agreed to autograph that book and keep it to you. And I, I, I think any day it will be a prize possession for each one of you. She is an ambassador for Mask for the Parkinson, which spreads awareness of breast cancer and simultaneously promotes highly health lifestyle women. She has received many awards: uh, Positive Health Award, <coughs> Outstanding Inspirational Woman Award, Creative Appreciation Award. Rose Ridwin Award, and I think the award carries on. I think, madam, you got much more award than any politician could get. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll win again. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, put your hand together to welcome <laughs> Neeraj Malik, and I'm. I can assure you, the, the most uncommon leader. We are going to have a very inspiring evening, both of us. <coughs> thank you, thank you, Vijay, and um, thank you, everybody. Good evening to all of you. Yeah. It's uh, awesome to see you. most of you are familiar now with this uh, this is i think my second appearance uh, with you and i must thank vijay it was an idea that uh, was kind of seeded um, in a casual coffee conversation uh, on how we can make um, the mma uh, events more interesting and uh, for vani and me the idea of the uncommon leader was brewing in our head for a, for a while uh, we are already doing a couple of um, uh, public programs um, focused on happiness uh, we're doing it one at the odc bookstore and the other one we're doing it at the indo korean center in boat club area and the other the second one is so called happiness conversation and both these programs look at um, individuals and people uh, who are uh, who have made interesting choices with their lives uh, and the, and that interesting choice is about being happy uh, and it's it's an uncommon choice by itself and for a long time we had been uh, the work that we do vani and i we work in the area of workplace happiness and for a long time we've been thinking in terms of an event series that uh, can be done for managers entrepreneurs uh, business people um, and corporate leaders you know uh, and uh, when vijay uh, uh, you know welcomed us with open arms with, when we shared the concept with him uh, we said hey this is the idea and it's called the uncommon leader now why is this leader uncommon Uh, i think there is a definition of uh, the leader that we all have in our in our head and uh, you know in recent times robin sharma has completely demolished that definition and he says the the original definition of a leader being in a cor corner office a leader holding a title a leader holding power uh, he said the titleless leader and he came up with this concept and you know the world kind of lapped it up uh, to me 
uh, each one of us is a leader uh, in our own way, and we're making choices and important decisions all the time. So we're leading our lives with, uh, with those choices. And therefore, we said we, we want to bring perspective into the management arena from outside the arena. That's the whole concept. Uh, it's not that we will not get a guest here who will uh, not be from the corporate sector or who will not be an entrepreneur. We may, uh, in, in the future, um, bring you those, those speakers as well, those guests as well. But our primary focus is going to be to look for leadership where we think it doesn't exist. And that's what the Uncommon Leader series is all about. And I go to a very great man uh, for my definition of leadership, which I hold dear. It's not an original idea. Uh, the man I'm talking about is the management thinker and uh, guru, uh, Noel Tichy. Noel Tichy says that leadership is the ability to see reality and mobilize the appropriate response. I don't think there can be a better definition of leadership. The ability to see reality and mobilize the appropriate response. Therefore, that makes anybody who sees reality and deals with that reality with uh, conviction, uh, which is excellent execution, which is values-based action, and which is facing the situation. Anybody who does these things is therefore a leader. And that's what made us zero in on Nirja over here. Uh, the very fact that she has uh, faced life, not just stoically. There is this word that comes from the Greek language, stoicism, which is the ability to face life's challenges strongly with inner strength. That's loosely the definition of stoicism. But there is a second part which Nirja brings to the table and makes her uh, role as an uncommon leader even more powerful, which is that she brings enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, again, comes from the Greek language. And enthusiasm, basically, the word comes from the Greek word entheos. Mm -hmm. And theos, as we all know, is uh, God. And N, E-N-N, T-H-E-O-S, theos, the two words that combine to form the word enthusiasm. And theos is God, N in Greek, E-N, means within, the God within. And so the uncommon leader here next to me, Nirja Malik, brings to us, ladies and gentlemen, the qualities of stoicism and enthusiasm, the zest to live life. Welcome her, ladies and gentlemen. Nirja Malik for you. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to find that my name is N for Nirja. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The God within. Yes. The God within. The God within. So uh, first of all, I'm very grateful to be here. So happy. And um, this is a wonderful package deal of my friends, Avis and Vani. And uh, you're right. There is something within the armed forces uh, fraternity that automatically makes you feel very warm towards anyone from that, uh, uh, you know, associated with that. So I'm very happy to be welcomed here. And uh, let's get on with it. Yes, let's get on <laughs> with it. The way we're going to structure it is uh, this is a conversation. So uh, this conversation will have two parts. Uh, actually, if you like, it can have three parts. Uh, one part is when I am in conversation with Nirja. That's uh, one A. And one B is, when we are conversing, there could be a conversation going on within you. Because we may be talking about Nirja's life. We may be talking about what we can learn from her. But we will also be having you conversing with yourself in terms of your life and what you are picking up. That's part A, part With one. your God within. Yeah, with your God within, absolutely. And the second part is uh, when we'll open it up for questions. And the way I'm going to do this um, is um, it's about 6.20 right now. and. Uh, for the next 40 odd minutes, I'll be in conversation with her, and then we will do a 20 minute Q&A involving all of you people. Uh, and I do expect um, uh, you to uh, you know, engage with Nirja, take this opportunity to engage with her, not just uh, by way of listening to her, but by, by way of conversing with her 
when we open up the floor for discussion. I look forward to that, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll tell you uh, how, uh, you know, Alagapun here was actually recounting the meeting that Vani and I had with Nija the first time. She attended one of our programs at the INCO Center, right? Yes, yeah. uh, the Happiness Conversation, and she was sitting at the back row, and uh, here was a lady that we had not met, we had not, uh, we had heard the name Nirja Malik, but didn't have a face to it, right? And, uh, she's, and she seemed to connect with some of the deepest spiritual aspects of life uh, so well. And there was an intrigue uh, qu quality to it. Uh, and it so happened that her book, I Inspire, launched within like three, four weeks of our meeting uh, at our event. And uh, we went to the book launch. We went late because of a traffic jam, something that I don't like to do, go late anywhere. But we went late. And we were uh, completely drawn into the book, the conversation she was having around the book. And later on, we read the book. And we felt that this is truly the person who represents the, uh, the, uh, the spirit of the uncommon leader. I'll tell you in one line. I'm sure you've read it. But just think, ladies and gentlemen, just think. A person who's brought up. And she's going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, so I'm coming to my first question. I'm just building the question in my mind as I'm speaking here. The, a person who's been brought up uh, with complete freedom, with a lot of love, laughter, and compassion. A person who she, she describes herself to me the other day when I was uh, talking to her for a, for, a, for a blog post that I wrote on, uh, on her. Uh, she described to her me, uh, me uh, herself to me as somebody who's who's a typical tomboy, you know, who's jumping around all over the place, climbing trees, and throwing people around if required, you know. Uh, so I, I could sense that she 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 had been brought up with complete, uh, you know, abandon, and then you get into uh, a set of setbacks, a set of setbacks, not one, not two, and the setbacks are number one, broken bones, then uh, delayed pregnancy. Uh, miscarriages, a stillborn baby, and then 12 years after marriage, she conceives and she delivers beautiful twins, Siddharth and Shivani, and then you would imagine... Premature know, by two months and five days. Premature, right. I'm sorry I missed that detail. Premature, and, and then you would imagine that, wow, life's turned around, everything's going fine, it's going to be fine. And then life throws at you not one, but two installments of cancer, two installments of breast cancer. Now, anybody, you know, anybody, I remember Amitabh Bachchan uh, saying this to Simi Garewal on her show. Simi said, uh, you, you have had your fair share of physical challenges, financial challenges, flops in your career, all of that. How do, how do, you, how do you deal with this fact that uh, you know, you have to still live on and face life. And he says, Nahi hota mujse. And he said this in Hindi, so I'll say this in Hindi, Bahut ho gaya, ab bas bhi karo. He says that's the way he prays, that it's, it's too much, I can't handle it anymore. I think that reflects the sentiment that any of us would have been in, having within us with those many setbacks. And yet she decided to face life. And over the last 18 years, She's completely transformed, not only the way she thinks, but the way the world looks at cancer and the way people look at challenges. So the two C words in her life, she's actually converted them and made them uh, you know, her USP, something, that she, something sh that she compassionately shares with people. So my first question to you, Nirja, we'll come to the inspirational part of it, right. but let's go to that, that really lonely time and I think we all are lonely in our, in our crisis, right? However much there may be family, however m there may be support systems, uh, I believe that we all have to bear our crosses, right? So the miscarriages happen to you. The, the stillborn baby happens to you. The cancer happens to you. So I want to go to that time of was there a lonely patch? Did you at all feel lonely? Did you feel hopeless? Mm -hmm. And what, what was your thought process at that time to bring yourself out of that? Actually, there are quite a few, but um, when you said lonely, I was wondering, have I been lonely? And then, yes, um, there have been two occasions in my life 
now that you've brought it to my thinking processes. The first was when I had my stillborn. And uh, I was absolutely uh, in my senses. I held the beautiful baby in my arms. And uh, I think only my mother and I actually saw the baby. Because I think uh, my husband, his parents, they didn't want to take away any memories of pain, of sorrow, of suffering. And then they took the baby and they went away. And I guess that was one lonely moment when I was left alone. And yes, I would have broken down because uh, I got married in 78. And uh, this was uh, <coughs> my twins were born in 1990. This was, I think, 1987 when I had the stillborn. And I think I've. I was really distraught. And then, it was so beautiful because I suddenly realized that these were the happiest eight months of my existence. I was so content, I was so happy, I was conversing with my baby within, I was feeling the kicks thrice a day, one o'clock six in the morning and six in the evening. And then there was nothing. There was a void. And what am I going to do to fill the void? And that's where God comes in. So the gentle thought that I was so happy crossed me over from a chasm which was unending, a well, where you feel that you could just keep dropping, 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 and who's going to pull you out? So those were the thoughts that, oh my God, I was so happy those eight months. I was so joyous. And then the next thought, thank you, God, for giving me that experience of complete satisfaction and contentment. And the third thought, you see how things build up. You have an association of ideas. And the third thought was, my God, I am so lucky. Because see, we are steeped in the concept of Hindu cycle of birth and death. And I said, I'm so lucky that this, this soul, this lovely baby of mine, this soul, had only eight months to live as a human being. And those were chosen to be within me. And that's when you change from horrific sorrow to gentle acceptance to joyousness and happiness for the best time possible. Fantastic, fantastic. And then when you reach that point of satisfaction, what next? Gratitude. Thank you, God, for choosing me. Thank you, this soul had only eight months to live, and now it has reached that point of nirvana, has gone beyond the cycle of birth and death. So beautiful, so, so beautiful. So that is Thank how you. I looked at Thank it. You. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, when I was asking that question, I was wondering if it would be very painful to go back to no, those memories. Not but, at all. but the way you, you talked it's, about it's it. It's so you know, beautiful. <laughs> just in the context of our. Uh, you know, everyday work life, uh, our, our business w world, and the, and the world of management and leading our lives, uh, the, the, the critical inference from what she just shared is we all often looking at what we don't have, uh, which is scarcity thinking. And we don't look at what we have, which is abundance thinking. And she just explained so beautifully, so poetically, what abundance thinking can do to you, you know? Horrific sorrow yes, to, to, to the complete blessing of having seen that soul uh, go away yes. and, and seek or attain nirvana, Absolutely. right? What a wonderful way to look at it. Uh, can I add something please, here? Please, please, please. So um, I've been counseling patients for the last uh, 17, 18 years, ever since I was diagnosed on Friday the 13th, February, 1990. I tell people, I tell patients, and 
not necessarily are they cancer patients. You have so much of uh, trauma in the lives of young people. So do you know what I tell them? I said, please do not have this feeling of, why me? Because the minute you have this feeling of, why me? It's like digging your own grave. So when you're grumbling, when you're full of self-pity, and when you think that you know, you're, you're caught up, you're actually making things worse. You're just digging yourself under the coupe, under the mud. So you're going deeper into the grave, and the mud is covering you. So even if God wants to send his grace to you and say, come, child, come, let me help you. Let me draw you out of all this. How will he reach you? Because you are not receptive. You are so full of, why me, self-pity, oh God, pavam, horrible, miserable negativity. So I think by and by I learned in my life that if there's one answer, it's positivity. And um, my blood group, by the way, is AB positive. So I say A, B positive. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Let me, let me ask you a question uh, more related to the practical, everyday challenges of having to live with, uh, you know, cancer, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and what kind of support systems did you delve on, apart from your inner positivity? Mm -hmm. uh, the process of treating cancer itself is painful, right? I mean, getting treated is painful. So how do you deal with the... Uh, the, the, the process of everyday living through a you know, f very, very challenging phase like yours, like the way you went through. And what kind of support systems exist? I mean, was there family who, who helped you along? And how did you lean on those crutches? Uh, first of all, I never felt they were crutches. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> um, so uh, Friday the 13th, I was diagnosed. And uh, if I may just digress a little here, someone came to me and said, I hate the 1st of January. And I said, why? And she said, my mother was diagnosed on that day. And I turned to her and I said, you know, Friday the 13th is supposed to be a very horrible day, but I love Friday the 13th because I was diagnosed on that day. And that, see, when a patient talks to me, I cannot remove the cancer. I cannot change what they're going through. But what I can change is their perception to it. What I can change is how they look at it. So I hugged her and I said, you know, you lucky thing. She said, why? I said, you should be celebrating it twice. She said, why? I said, your mother was diagnosed. And because she was diagnosed, you could follow up the treatment. Because she was following up on the treatment, she's cured. And because she's cured, you have your mother. So why are you thinking of something that is not even worth thinking about? Move on. So anything that happens to me, God's grace, I will never say that it is I, me, myself, I will say that he perhaps figured out that here is this person who, because of her faith in me, because of her family set up, it is not a religious family. I belong to a very spiritual family. My parents, my sister, they're not God-fearing, they're God-loving. And that makes a big difference. So if I can tell you here that my great-grandfather was Mahatma Hansraj, who started the DAV schools and colleges in Pakistan. And uh, we've been, my mother comes from a family, a Sadar family in Kapoorthala. And I think they, their firm belief, they didn't have to tell me, hey, pray. I just, we just imbibed it automatically. They never stopped me. We were always in convents because, as you know, staff, uh, the staff of the armed forces gets transferred. So the convents were the ones who would take us in, whether it was in the middle of a term or not. 
we went to churches, we went to dargahs, we went to gurdwaras, we went to temples. Like you rightly said in the beginning, I grew up with a lot of freedom. And uh, with that freedom comes strength. I know that people say with freedom comes responsibility. But I think with freedom comes strength. And I remember passing the same freedom on to my children. Because when they could speak, I said, say the Gayatri Mantra three times. Say, Ikumkar Satnam once. Say, La ila illa la Muhammadur Rasulillah. Say, thank you, God, for the world so sweet. And finally, talk to God, whatever you want to say. So for a very long time, they would come to me and they say, Mom, what are we? And I would say, what do you mean? Are we Hindu? Are we Muslim? Are we Sikh? Are we Christian? What are we? And I said, if anyone asks you this, just say, you are a citizen of the world. And so we went to a hospital when my daughter was uh, requiring a doctor's attention. And you have this form, religion. <laughs> so I thought I was very smart. I wrote Indian. And my, my daughter said, mm -mm. she snatched the pen from my hand and she scratched out Indian. And I said, what is she going to do now? And she wrote there, universal. <laughs> Fantastic. So I think this is what happens. You start imbibing. So my surgery was fixed here. Friday the 13th, I was diagnosed. 18th was supposed to be my surgery. And my mom said no. My twins were only seven years old. My mom said, no. We will send one lady to look after your bachas. You will come to Bombay. And I had my mother, my father, my sister, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, my two brothers-in-laws, their wives, my friends. I had these angels in my life. So I never looked upon them as crutches. crutches. I looked upon them as my strength. Not only my inner strength, my outer strength. And that is why I felt that when I come back to Chennai, I want to start a support group for cancer patients. Because I had this wonderful womanly support group, mother, mother-in-law, sister, sisters-in-laws. But I was shattered. I was shattered because this lady came to me and she said, oh, sorry, you can't. I said, what? No, you have to live for five years before you can start counseling. And I said, why? And she said, no, you have to be a survivor. Because if something happens to you, all the patients will feel very depressed. disheartened mm. and depressed. Now, supposing I had listened to her seven years of my life from 19... 98, 98 to 2005 to 2004 when I was diagnosed again I would have come across millions of patients and each patient in India comes with 12 or 18 family members so imagine how many people I would have not had the opportunity to of to connect to, to connect out. with to reach out with and I said thank you God because my uncle in December of the same year said, look, my friend's uh, relative is coming from uh, Calcutta, and he's very low. So will you just go and meet him? And that is how, by default, I you started, started counseling. I, I want to just pick on one yes. point here, yes. elaborate it, and then I'm going to ask you a question, I think, which is very relevant. The answer to mm -hmm. that question is very relevant. Uh, so the point I'm trying to pick up here is that in any situation, we have to do what we have to do. I think the world will tell us many things. People will give you advice. And I think an integral aspect of leadership is you have to make that decision. So she could have heard the naysayer or the uh, overcautious uh, person that was giving her the advice that don't start a support group, you cannot start it. She could have heard that or she could have heard her inner voice. And I think a leader's uh, f fundamental ability is to listen to that inner voice. That's one thing I pick up. And the other thing, of course, is that uh, you, you know, if we are raised in, in whatever environments we are raised in, uh, the, the values and the 
uh, you know, the upbringing that we, that we are raised with, they help us along, you know, greatly. And when you, uh, you know, when you talked about uh, the spiritual, um, you know, the, the culture of your family, uh, the spiritual culture really helped you uh, with the strength when it was needed the most. So uh, it's something that we miss. You know, we all bring uh, a lot of our work home. Please understand this. We all bring a lot of our work home. And today with the smartphones, uh, we are always, uh, quote unquote, at work. But do you also pause to reflect that we actually carry a lot of our home into our work? The way we are raised plays a very important role in the way we deliver at work. And that is the ability of a good leader is to go and draw on the inner resources when the time comes. And that's the responsibility that we have towards our children as well. I'm coming to now the question, which I think will um, be very relevant I'd to the audience. I'd just audi like audience. to add here that you're absolutely right. But this is such a lovely concept, uh, taking the work home. And I never thought of taking the home to work. So it is the security the love, the freedom of my immediate family, that made me the person I am. And uh, you're absolutely right. This is food for thought. I'm going to go home and think about <laughs> it. Taking your home. We, we're taking it all work. the time. But you're so right. Because whatever I've learned at home, uh, to be loving, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be helpful, to be uh, empathetic, uh, to be uplifting, these are all things that we learn from within us and, and uh, enthusiasm. <laughs> yes, uh, my name is going to be Nirja Enthusiastic Malik from now. <laughs> Thank you for that thought. My question, no, it's a, it just flowed through me, so I just shared it. I'm just looking at you sitting here. Uh, uh, would you like to tell them about your first date with chemo and what your dad told you? Because from, we're all corporate soldiers, right? We think we know everything and we know uh, how to deal with our situations or sometimes we think we are hopeless and we cannot deal with it. Uh, and I think there is a very important learning that Nisha is gonna share. I'll amplify that learning, but let her tell that part of the story. Her first date with chemo. So, um, my parents always encouraged me in games. I was the games captain. Uh, they let me go for the first national cross country race of India. I did all kinds of things and I was allowed without any thought, NCC, sergeant, best shot, lying down, kneeling, standing. So I went to Papa, my father, and I said, you know, Papa, I'm going to fight cancer. And I felt very, uh, okay, whatever had happened, it's a compartment, SDPA. I'm sure the management uh, fraternity is aware, study, diagnosis, plan of action. So the way I've always looked at problems is study, diagnosis, plan of action, and move on. So I thought, here, yeah, everyone's going to be very proud of me. I'm going to fight cancer. And my father, commander in the Indian Navy, Indian Armed Forces, uh, Aryan, warrior, soldier, uh, mentioned in dispatches. And he turned to me and he said, Bita, why are you using the word fight? Fight is such a negative word. Why don't you change it to face? Face cancer. And that kind of registered deep within me. And then onwards, everything has been faced as a challenge, not fought against. Because fighting becomes aggressive. Fighting becomes defensive. But to face it, hum hongi kamyab, badte chalo, karte chalo, and you'll get there. We can do it, just do it. That's beautiful, right. beautiful, beautiful, thank you. So face life, don't fight it. Uh, take any situation that you're, you're dealing with, any, any crisis, any, sometimes it need not be a crisis, it can just be a very, very painful situation. It can be a, a, a job situation, it can be a business situation, it can be a relationship situation, whatever you're dealing with, instead of fighting it, instead of resisting it, if you start facing it, 
it becomes a lot more easier to handle. The other thing about fighting something is that it, it saps a lot of energy. And in a day, we have only so much energy, right? And that energy, if you can save, conserve, and divert, and deploy uh, in, in facing a situation, then you are, you are up to facing it far more stronger. You know, uh, you, you and I, all of us, are people that have to feel uh, good every day that we wake up. And I think facing life makes, gives you that feel good from within, right? Uh, I hear you talk a lot about, um, um, you know, I, I hear you and it's there in the book as well, uh, talk a lot about God, okay? And, uh, and, and I heard you also say that you, you, you're, you're not the religious kind, right? Uh, so I'm going to clarify a point here and then ask Nirja the question. Uh, the entire definition of God uh, is individual. It's, it's individual to each one of us. To me, it's a higher energy. Obviously, the energy is more int uh, you know, intelligent than I am. I cannot make you understand what I am saying. You are understanding it. So obviously, the energy is far more intelligent. Okay? And there is a lot of confusion between religi religion and spirituality. You know, religion is uh, something that uh, you know, is, again, very individual and fear-inducing. So I'm glad you clarified that, you know, God-loving versus God-fearing. How much does gratitude and this whole aspect of being grateful for challenges thrown at you, how much does that help in A, facing a situation and B, in evolving through the situation? A any experiences? Uh, I think my whole life has been an experience <laughs> of that. <laughs> so, um, how can you be grateful for a cancer? You know, how can you be grateful for a problem? That's my you question. You know what my, so my dad said, face it, don't fight it. And my mother would say, everything happens for the best. And I would want to tell her, hey, I just broke my bone. And uh, what do you expect good to come out of it? But truly, something or the other would happen. So that also got embossed in my psyche. And because of her uh, unconditional nurturing love, I think I had the advantage of these two things. So not that someone told me that you have been made in the image of God. These are things that you feel yourself. So first, I'm very passionate about my belief in God. And I feel you're right. It is a, a superlative, supreme being, almighty. Uh, with or without form, depending on how you choose to look at exactly. God. It's individual. Right? Absolutely. So my take has always been, okay, buddy, you've given me a problem. Now it's your problem to give me a solution. I'm free. <laughs> because if I thought of, oh my God, cancer twice, <gasps> this is what happened, so many miscarriages, democracy is sword hanging on my head, I don't think I would have been able to do anything. The other thing I believe is that I am made in the image of God. Have you ever heard of God having a back pain or a knee pain? And uh, like we Punjabis always say, good does and more does. No. So therefore, if I get pain and I'm 117 kgs, I just say, be gone. I am made in the image of God. And it is my birthright to be healthy and to be happy. I do not accept it. Buzz off. And I have told people this, that listen, if you keep talking about pain in your knee, your goodas and mudas, I turned to this lady and I said, do you love your sons? And she said, what, what kind of a question is that? So I said, you have been talking to your friends for the last hour and a half. And you haven't mentioned your sons at all. All I've heard you say is the pain. And I promise you, if I was the pain in your body, I would feel so comfortable. I would, <laughs> I would never want to leave you. You are talking about me. You are loving me. You are <laughs> coaxing me. You are cajoling me. I wouldn't. 
So it, it makes a difference on how you look at it. And people say, oh, you've had your uterus removed. Did you get joint pains? I said, look, if you're going through so much trouble with your uterus, you're bleeding, and it's, it's interfering with your daily existence, please get it removed. And God will take care of you. You will take care of yourself. I had my uterus removed in 95, uh, 21st of November. And I uh, don't have uh, aching uh, joints or whatever. Maybe I just say, be gone. It could be my attitude. But the fact of the matter is, isn't that what life is? Your attitude, your motivation, how you look at life, how you choose to look at it. Idhar jau ya udhar jau. Haste haste karu ya rote rote karu. A uh, patient came to me and she was crying. I said, what happened to you? She used to look as if she stepped out of the Vogue magazine. She didn't have a leg. I think I'm going to bore Prakash because I told him this story on the way here. And uh, she said, no, when I get pain here, I feel cancers come back when I get pain here. And she's crying, weeping across the table from me. So I just told her, I said, you know something? I'm so happy you've come here today. Had you come tomorrow, we wouldn't have met. She said, why not? I said, oh, a couple of days back, I'd gone for a movie. Uh, picture dekhte ho, to coffee or popcorn banta hai. Or jab wo coffee, uh, popcorn khate to girta hai. So I was just removing, you know, brushing it aside and suddenly I felt a lump. This was just two years back, two, three years back. So I said, you know, I'm going to Bombay tomorrow. And had you not come from Philippines or Mauritius, one of those places, today I wouldn't have met you. She started, <gasps> till then she was just crying. Now she started heaving and sighing and wailing. So I said, what happened to you? So unfair. I said, unfair for what? For you. So obviously she's done her homework, she's gone through the net, she's got my entire history. You broke these bones and the whole thing came out, so many miscarriages and so this, this, that operation, the other. And I just turned to her and I said, you know something, I'm just certain about two things. The day I was born and the day I'm going to die. Now, in between, if things happen to me, and I think, oh my God, this is the be all and end all of existence. My whole life and the, the adventurous uh, traumatic things that have happened to me, I would be dying from one incident to the other. In fact, I wouldn't have a chance to live. So, whenever something happens, consider it as only a word. Don't think that this is the be-all and end-all of existence. And laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> I'll, come to, I'll come to laughter. <laughs> I had a question on laughter. But, you know, the, the fact that whatever happens, treat it as work. And, you know, in her book, she talks about it. She, she talks about it in her talks as well, that cancer is work. Dealing with cancer is work. Dealing with your life situation is work. Don't think work is where you go and get paid for. Living is a 24 by 7 responsibility. But I wouldn't call and it living work. Fully, right? So you <laughs> deal with it with, with that zest. Yes, right? yes. You deal with yes. it with that zest, with that responsibility that you bring, it, bring to your work. With right? joy. With In joy. fact, the thing is, you know, they say work is worship. But if you're passionate about something, you don't consider it work. It's a joy. It's spontaneous. I don't have to think. It, it just, just happens. Flows. It flows through. It you. flows so beautifully. But talk about fun and laughter. I mean, you. Uh, I heard him. Sp uh, that part I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> that you watched 56 movies during your <laughs> yeah. first round of hospitalization and surgery and all of that, back to back, or <laughs> you know, like a record you created for yourself. Yes. And and then you you've always done things which are bizarre. You know, like somebody tells you don't start a support group and you will go and start a support group. Uh, somebody tells you there might have been uh, dietary restrictions during surgery and post-surgery and you, you would actually break them, right? You talk about that in the book. So how, how much is this feeling of joy, doing what comes to you naturally and making you feel good, how much does that help in dealing with situations that are tough? I think you have hit the nail on the head. Because if you go through life with a joyous attitude, 
then I think your body cells know that you're enjoying yourself. Now, when we are sad and we've fought with someone, our hands get clammy, our forehead frowns, there's knots in our stomach. And what does the body do? It creates toxins. When you're happy and laughing, your body just knows how to create. And what does it do? It creates happy hormones or it creates endorphins. Now, if you laugh more, you've got more endorphins. And those endorphins gobble up the toxins. Now, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was given 25% chances of survival if I went to America or France, because they had started stem cell research there. And I, my twins were only seven. I wept for three whole days. I wept. And after three days of crying, I don't think I could have cried anymore. <laughs> after three days of crying, I said to myself, who's told me this? A human being, na? God didn't come down and say, your days are numbered. Or uh, start counting backwards. So I wiped my tears and I loved that shampoo called No More Tears, Johnson's mm. Baby Shampoo. <laughs> I said, no more tears? I'm going to live for my kids. Dhrid Nishche, you've seen Hindi movies where the woman says, enough. Main ab ye karungi. <laughs> so I did that. And I said, I'm going to live for my kids. That's it. So lots of things happened en route. Uh, I got cancer again. But it never occurred to me to go, hi, kya hoga? What's going to happen? No. I said, okay, let it come. Ye bhi dekh lenge. So one of those things was that I think my attitude, uh, which my parents perhaps were not very happy with, that if you're told not to do something, you will jolly, jolly will do it. You reminded me of something. I got measles or you know, chicken pox or something when I was little, and I was told, don't read, because your eyes will get spoiled. And you read? Oh, my dear, at night with a torch under the cover. <laughs> And after they've gone to sleep and Binaka, Geet Mala and all that kind of thing. I had no business to write down the songs during chicken pox. Who wants to write? No, but I was told not to read. I had to do everything. And feel very happy about doing something and getting away with it. <laughs> you see? So I think my psyche is that. Someone says, no, I'm 62. I'm going to turn 62 in June. And uh, my relatives turned to me and my friends and they said, if you can all understand Punjabi, which I will translate, Tiri mat mari gai hai? Tu cycling jang di hai? Zaroorat ki hai cycling karan di? Just this morning I did 15 kilometers on a cycle. I've joined a group called Bob. Babes on bikes, boys on bikes, <laughs> and brats on bikes. And I've fallen three times, uh, but I, I'm very uh, safety conscious. Helmet hota hai, light hota hai, sab kuch hota hai. But the fact of the matter is, Someone says, nahi karo. Karo. <laughs> Maza aega. <laughs> ha, and then you know you're told during the chemo, don't have this and don't eat bar ka khana. Because see, the doctors are absolutely right. And I tell my patients that too. Because when your immunity is low, when the chemotherapy has uh, affected you, in the middle part of your chemo of three weeks, the, the sec second week, the middle week is very dangerous. And you don't want to catch a stomach infection when your immunity is low. So what was my thinking? Ha, ah, they won't give me another chemo until my cells are good. If my cells are good, that means they can tackle it. So my mother would go home from Jaslok Hospital and guess what was next door in Purnima Apartments? Domino's Pizzas. <laughs> so, hello. <laughs> And these guys would sail into the hospital at any given time and do home delivery, sorry, room delivery with a smile. And one day I got caught because normally one gobbles up everything. Then I couldn't eat that much. So these were lying there, the dabbas and the crumbs. And my mom said, hey, kya? <laughs> <laughs> so I think the excitement of doing something that you're not supposed to do also helps me. The adventure, the joy. The adventure, the joy. The joy. joy. Chalo, pani hai. It's rushing furiously. What fun. Let me jump into it. <laughs> Dekha jayega if one comes out at the other end. Fine if one doesn't. 
one doesn't know about it. So I think I've gone through life with that. I think hearing you speak uh, <laughs> reminds me that, you know, she, she embodies the spirit of zindagi na milegi dobara, you know, that you will not get another chance at life. So live the life that you have fully. I'm going to ask one last question before we throw it to the audience uh, for their interaction with you. And the question is, uh, now look at Neerja, 62, but, uh, you know, she cycles, she leads the pink Zumba. Zumba, she goes Zumba dancing, uh, she does, uh, you know, the pinkathon, pink she leads the pinkathon movement uh, in Chennai. In Chennai. Uh, she counsels people, f uh, you know, patients demand that they are with her, she's with percent. them when they are going in for a surgery, when they're coming out. So her calendar is full. And then she's got, obviously, like any other, uh, you know, a person, she's got a home to look after. Her he's husband, forgotten the right? talks. Yeah, the talks. <laughs> yeah, the talks that she delivers. She del You delivered, what, eight talks in, in between, five days in March? Between in the 3rd yeah. of March and the 14th of March. March. She delivered I eight talks. I gave her eight talks because of Women's International Day. Yes. So she so was, all, she, you were all over the place, you're food. doing multiple things. <laughs> and I think many people here ask about, uh, or, or people in life look for, how do I balance my work and my life? How do I manage my time better? How do you manage to pack so much into your life? You have to be a Gemini. <laughs> you have to multitask. I'm a Gemini, 11th of June. I have twins. And uh, I'm basically doing two things, uh, cancer counseling and... Uh, inspirational speeches and also my aunt had started oh please congratulate us today sankalp was born in 1991 oh fantastic yes sankalp is the 13th the, of the, april the NGO happy basakhi to everyone and uh and Nirja, hanji strangely interestingly huh? it's 13th of april that's what i mean so th 13th <laughs> 13th was the friday the 13th was friday when you were the diagnosed 13th. there you, this, go. you know? there you go so if that 13th had not happened, this 13th would not have happened. Absolutely right. right. You're so, so you can right. only connect the dots backwards. Yes, right? yes. And, and feel joyous about it. This is something else to feel. I think we should not lose a moment where we can be joyous. You will take out the best out of everything. You know, if anything negative happens, why do they say every cloud has a silver lining? You've got to just look for it. You've got to be aware that, yes, silver lining hair. And if you can do that, life's made. The way I'll, I'll take this and give it to you is that, you know, in, in business management, we talk about um, assets, right? Uh, uh, performing assets and non-performing assets. And I, I, I must tell you, out of our experience, hearing Nirja talk today, happiness yeah. is a performing asset because happiness uh, is it gives you the edge, gives you the ability to stay positive, and happiness, therefore, is profitable. Yeah. It, it is hugely profitable. Look at this lady. I mean, she's a living example of that. You know? Fantastic. So thank you so much for your perspectives. Um, I think you. we'll involve the audience now, right? We'll involve the love audience. Love to, love to hear questions. So please, for the next uh, 15 minutes, uh, I'll moderate questions. Uh, please uh, circulate mics and... Vardarajan here has got the first question. Vardarajan, sir, yes, your sir. name, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, good evening, ma'am, and uh, good evening, sir. The, uh, the dialogue was really inspirational and interesting. Uh, you mentioned you, were, you have a background of armed forces, and uh, generally armed forces belong to well-to-do social status. I think you're wrong there. <laughs> Things are okay. changing a lot in okay. society. <laughs> uh, okay, I stand corrected. But ha having said that, uh, does background in the armed forces and uh, a lot of support from the support system, the strong support, the military support, so to say, help in tackling uh, chaos or crisis like this? But uh, generally, in general life, this support system is not there and this background is not there. No. So how do, you, how do you tackle a situation how does a person tackle a situation if not in this uh, scenario? See, by the time all these things happen to me, uh, it, what the uh, armed forces did was to give me the attitude, okay? So in the Navy, you don't have batmen, you don't have people who look after your homes, you don't have any of that. You're kind of left alone. And the sad thing is that when you retire, 
a lot of uh, the benefits are also removed from you. So I don't think we can uh, talk about uh, uh, a very uh, affluent society because I remember that my father took premature retirement to join the foreign merchant navy because he had two daughters that he had to get married and he wanted to buy two houses. So he, he did that with the Iraqi maritime services and other foreign companies rather than the um, Indian uh, armed forces. Things have changed, by the way. I guess they get a better salary now. Uh, so the support system I got was from the strength, the spiritual strength of my family and friends, my in-laws, my parents. It was more an emotional, mental, and spiritual strength from where my physical got uplifted. You see? Because this is what we belong to, PMES, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. So if these three were not there, I don't think I would be sitting here and chatting so happily. So I think it is the masbuti, the foundation, the zinda dili of the parents, uh, the loving sister, uh, the very supportive husband and kids and in-laws. It's that goes in, which may need not necessarily be because of the armed forces, Correct. but by the way, we, I, I uh, am very proud to belong to the family because we have friends, you know, wherever you traveled. There was never this feeling of, oh my God, new class, will I make friends? One just went there, if there were nine people and I joined, they were naughty nine, and when I joined, we became troublesome ten. <laughs> so we took those things for granted, you know? So it was the happy-go-lucky, zinda dili. And hota tha, we had to climb it, pani hota tha. Now, the kids are different. They've got their iPads, their iPhones, their, uh, I, I saw this, um, this uh, funny serial where two kids are sitting on the same sofa and chatting with each other. They both got their laptops on and they're both doing their own thing. So the uncle comes in and he says, what are you doing? I mean, you're two of you sitting on the same sofa. Why don't you talk to each other? They looked at him and they said, but that's what we're doing. That's what they're doing. Yeah. So they were chatting on the laptop with each other rather than communicating one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So this is the sadness of, uh, you know, the times changing. And but, but uh, the, but I think the important point she's uh, uh, made is that it doesn't necessarily have to do with the armed forces. I yes. think it's got to do with the people, the family. The you know, support uh, system. We, we, uh, we, yeah, we'll, so we'll take the next question now. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Madam, you said you underwent chemotherapy. Did the pangs and pains of chemo uh -huh. result in the realization of godliness? Uh, okay. Now, when I talk to my patients and tell them about everyone is petrified of chemotherapy, uh, you must realize that when the chemotherapy medicine came for my Masi Kamchachi, who passed away in 83, uh, we had to get the medicine from abroad, and uh, the customs had an issue uh, giving us these life-saving drugs because they didn't know better. But there has been so much of advancement, sir. So what I tell patients is that, dekho, you're worried about nausea, pain. I mean, you get to know all the negatives. I said, if you do research on a 1,000 patients with the chemotherapy, one person will have nausea, the other will have pain, the other will have itching sensation, the other's uh, tongue will go black, the nails will go black, all kinds of terrible stuff. But they are those who don't suffer the side effects at all. So what do you need to do? This is what I tell my patients, and it works big time. I say, I've met you today. Tomorrow, if I meet you somewhere outside, I will welcome you and say, hi, how are you? I will welcome you, because you're a friend now. You've met me. So I say, please, look at your chemotherapy with the eyes of your friend. Your chemotherapy is your friend. It is good for you. Now, if I say, Bayangara, Bayo, what happens? My body will resist it. So I tell them, please, accept chemotherapy. Welcome chemotherapy. Because if you accept it mentally, if you accept it emotionally, 
spiritually, then it is going to help you physically. A lot of people will say, oh, I'm scared, I don't want it. But if you go with that attitude, it will not work. So when I talk, the patients realize that I've been there, done that. And you know what? They laugh at me first. I tell them that when you see the chemotherapy coming into your veins, just look at it and say, divine energy in the chemotherapy. Please just destroy my bad cells and try and leave my good cells alone. So that makes you proactive. And let me tell you, 98, I vomited and vomited and vomited. But in 2004, the second time, they had given me AMSET. 2004, I got granny set. I said, Are, ye to set ki nani hai. <laughs> and you won't believe it, I didn't vomit even once. So with the advancement in science, not only for chemotherapy, but also for the drugs that control the side effects of the chemotherapy. We are at an age when diagnostics, it's a small cell. It gets caught early, PET scan, you have so many things. So I think we are at the right age. And that fear, cancer is just a word, nothing more. I talk about water, I talk about table, I talk about his very <laughs> smart looking tie. Nothing happens to us but someone says cancer. <laughs> because it happens to be the burden of generations. That is not necessary now. I hope I've answered your question, sir. I'll come to you, sir. Yes, I'll come to you for your question. But I just want to add here to, to the gentleman's question there. Does pain lead you to godliness? And I, so I'm not necessarily referring to pain through a physical condition like cancer. I think any form of pain comes to us without an invitation. None of us go and say, Papa, please, so we don't invite pain, but pain arrives. I think what pain does is, if I come and pinch you, you'll get rattled, right? Now a pinch, you can slap me back, but how do you slap back life? So, what is the artham puriyaliyo, what is the artham puriyaliyo, now, we look at the, the, that whole uh, energy as God, you know, or you'll go to a temple, you'll go to a church, you'll go to a Gurdwara. So, pain is awakening. That's what I will tell you. you know, pain awakens you. And pain awakens you and makes you aware that it's not in your control. Ah, but you know what pain stands for? Pain's positive attitude in negative situations. P A. I N S. Fantastic, fantastic. And what does fear stand for? False emotions appearing real. real. Or fantasized experiences appearing real. Hindu philosophy is fantastic. There is a rope lying there and I'm scared. I will think it is a snake. But if I am not scared, I will see, I will see the rope for the rope and I will kick it. And one more. What is problems? Productive roadblocks offering beneficial lessons, enhancing mental strength. So the more, what is a habit? To look at life positively is a habit. You become so deep into the habit that it takes no effort. You walk, it takes no effort. You look at life positively, it takes no effort. So it's not as bad or as great or as brave or as courageous as others think. It becomes a part of your psyche. It becomes a part of life. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, sir. The third question. Okay, please go ahead. I'll come to you, sir. Good evening to you both, madam <coughs> and uh, Mr. Amis. It was great listening to the conversation between you, both of you. Uh, what I liked is you are uh, conveying a message to the world, A, hey, be positive. That's really, really good, madam. It really touched my heart. Number two, what I don't like is that you have been rendering support to mothers, sisters, and grandmothers, and so on, womanly support. 
Does it mean that men are deprived of your support? <laughs> Not at all, <laughs> but sometimes men feel shy. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I must tell you one thing, sir. This is a lovely, uh, lovely point. Earlier, when I had started the support group, I was adamant. See, life teaches you. I was adamant that anyone as part of my support group has to have gone through cancer. Then I found that there weren't many takers, many people supporting me. So I said, okay, you don't have to have gone through cancer, but you need to know someone in your family or neighborhood who's gone through it. You need to understand it. I still didn't get many takers. And then I changed it to, I just want a humane human being who is empathetic. And one man, all these are women, one man came up to me and he said, Madam, I have no idea what cancer is. I don't know anyone with cancer, but I want to help you. He probably read about me on Google or whatever. And I said, sure. And I was very relieved because men felt comfortable with men. As a woman feels comfortable. There are a lot of people still who feel comfortable, women who feel comfortable with a woman gynecologist. So it kind of comes like that. But there are a lot of people who come to me who are men. But men, as women, don't like it known that they've gone through something. Also, a man will not readily ask for directions. He might get lost, but he will not ask for directions. So he doesn't like to tell people that he's going through A, B, or C. It is a matter of pride. It is a matter of ego. It could be arrogance, whatever. And one respects that. So there are a lot of men who do come to me, especially with word of mouth. It, it is happening that I will never say I've got an equal number of men that I answer, but the tribe is increasing. <laughs> Very good. We have time for one last question, please. Yes. Uh, and did you feel uh, immobilized at any point of time, gripped with negative energy or worries, or were you always the usual happy-go-lucky positive person? Wonderful question. There was a time. There is some drug. Now, you see, I was 44 when I was diagnosed the first time. I was 51 when I was diagnosed the second time. So they gave me very aggressive medication, very aggressive. And this particular drug gave me a lot of pain in my body to the extent that I could not sit like this. No part of my body could touch. So there was one time when I was sitting on the edge of my bed, right on the edge. And uh, like he said, enough is enough. I was sitting right on the edge because if I sat any more, I would get the more expanse of your body touches, the more pain you have. And I remember, I just put my head down in my hand. And I'm very receptive and open to anything that happens to me. And I felt that there was a hand on my head as if someone was blessing me, as my father used to do. Every time I went for a chemo or a, a, a radiation or a, you know, a surgery, he would put his hand on my head and say a mantra. I felt that kind of pressure. And I looked up and I felt that uh, Shirdi Sai Baba was standing there. So it kind of changed my thinking. It, it kind of gave me a little, you thought that I'm not there for you in any form. I've had experiences with uh, Satya Sai Baba with Parmansa Ramakrishna, Sharda Mahan, and I, they're all my friends. I feel so comfortable with them. So that was one time, you're so right, that I had given up hope. I'd said, Bot ho gaya. I can't take this anymore. You know? And then that slight pressure, and I look up and I feel his presence there, presence there blessing me. and. Just, you know, that smile and saying, come on, you can do it, yeah. It changed me. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, absolutely, last question. We, are, we need to wrap it up. Uh, okay. It is not a question. Uh, you were brave enough to face all challenges in your life. It's a wonderful story you have told us. 
and you were you are not only brave by yourself you made all of us to be brave in our life also thank you thank, thank you so you much so that's much. a fantastic way to end it um, um i you know uh, my book is outside yeah i was going to talk about <laughs> it so uh, we both are authors so we know <laughs> we know this is uh, this is something very important uh, mm. this is a beautiful book uh, i've read it vani has read it uh, it's called i inspire and uh, it's it's brought out by jayko it's a book that talks about uh, her story but it talks about it from a ma manner in which it can be useful to anybody not necessarily somebody going through cancer uh, and it talks about it's it, you know th there is a there is a beautiful line under that uh, and i think this line is more powerful than i inspired as far as i'm concerned a unique treasure hunt you know in the days that i grew up there used to be a, pro a program on tv called bharat ek khoj Okay, it was a beautiful program in those good old days when Doordarshan was the only channel, and I think life itself is a khoj, is a treasure hunt, and that's what her grandmother taught her. And as you read this book, you will be able to relate to the uh, treasures that she unearths through her various experiences of life. So please do buy the book or buy it and gift it to people that you know. And it's not necessary that somebody should be going through cancer to read this book. This is not about cancer, this is about life. And this is about being those two things that Nirja Malik epitomizes, okay? One is that she is fully, I mean, she's the uncommon leader, of course. She's got that leadership ability in her to take charge of her life happily, joyously, and enthusiastically. Yes, and. Enthusiastically, <laughs> very, very important. So I'll wrap up and hand it over to uh, Group Captain Vijay Kumar here, but I just want to, say that you know way back as a young um, um, you know executive trying to make my mark in life i followed jack welsh a lot you know jack welsh one of the greatest leaders and he his principle of leadership was based on a simple formula and the formula was four e's plus one p and those of you who have read management will relate to the four e's and p very very you know uh, well the four e's stood for uh, energy, mm -hmm. energize, that's the second D, the ability to energize, okay? The third was edge, edge. the fourth was execution, mm -hmm. and the P was passion. Ah. And Nirja Malik, to me, the uncommon leader, has energy, oodles of positive energy. She has the ability to energize others. <coughs> she lives life on the edge. Okay, Actually. and lives it fully, Absolutely. right? She went to work on her problems saying, if you have given me the problems, she told life or God, you know, if, if you have given me the problem, it's your problem to give me the solution also. Let me go to work on it, that's it. And look at her passion to live. I think that's what we'll all take away this evening. Thank you so much, Nirja, for being here. Thank you and Thank so you for much. joining us. I'll hand it over to Group Captain. You Nirja know, they, they asked me, I inspire. Uh, is it, what is it about? So I said, it's I, me, and myself. Is it about cancer? I said, no. Yes, it's been a part of my life, so of course I will mention cancer. But no, this book is not about cancer. It's about the joy of living. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, madam. It's been a fascinating evening. I think the takeaway has been phenomenal. But one thing coming from the Armed Forces family, but somebody said uh, very affluent, and I think that's a good perception with one of war OP coming, I think we should be happening soon. <laughs> and uh, Friday the 13th, she mentioned uh, we are very, very sentimental about the 13th the Friday. We never do anything. The, we, we stop, I think we don't fly on Friday the 13th, actually. We don't do that. And similarly, even MMA, we don't organize many events on Friday the 13th. Sentiment sometimes really helps, and because you can relax on that day. Thanks uh, so much. It's been a fascinating evening. Thanks, Aviz. Uh, Thank you, madam. Your presence is uh, really wonderful. Thanks, viewers who have been watching the program live from all our uh, management association, all the chapters. Uh, now, Avis, may I request you to please join me to present a memento on behalf of MMA. Yes. Thank you, madam, and uh, it's really a pleasure having you with us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and wish you all uh, 
very very happy tamil news day tomorrow till we meet again goodbye get back home safely and uh, celebrate with a lot of happiness and take away what you have taken today bye bye and good night